Welcome to every writing student's favorite topic, documentation. And I want to say, don't panic. When you're a freshman and sophomore in college, we are not looking for perfection in documentation. We're looking for a few basic skills. Still, there's adequate and there's good and excellent. And if you want the good or excellent grade, you do need to be paying attention to where the periods and the italics go, but we'll get to that later. First of all, let's talk about why it's important to document sources. Remember that someone's ideas are their intellectual property. In other words, they can make money off that. And if you use their ideas, you owe them money for that idea because it belongs to them. However, in education, we base our whole life around the free exchange of ideas, even though they belong to other people. And that doesn't mean that we get out of paying for them. It just means we have to pay for a different name in a different way. And we pay with acknowledgement. And we acknowledge other people's ideas through documentation, saying, you know, where we got that information and who it belongs to. And we're looking for two things, really, when we talk about adequate documentation in college. And that's, first of all, did you exercise what we call due diligence? Did you document every idea that's not your own, whether it's directly quoted, paraphrased, or summarized? And secondly, is it traceable? Can we go from where you use that information in text to the list of sources at the end of your essay and from there out to the real world to find the original source? There are four main systems for documentation that are used in colleges and universities and lots of smaller ones and you may be asked at any time to use any one of these four or one you've never heard of. So the trick is really how to learn to use the book to find the models and examples that you need. So let's look at that. First of all, remember that there are two parts to any system no matter what it is. A list of a ways to do internal or in-text documentation, you know, recognizing to your writers within your essay that you're using borrowed information. And second, that list of sources that you actually used at the end, the thing that's going to be able to help readers trace that source in the outside world. And if you need to know how to do both either the in-text or the works cited page or the references or whatever we call them, you've got to get out the style manual for whatever style you're using and find those models and examples. Organizations like the APA and the MLA produce whole huge books on that. Something like the pocket style manual that we use in this class just condenses everything down to the most basics and contains more than one style so that you can take it from class to class. So I highly recommend you hanging on to that pocket style manual when you leave this course. So no matter the style, you've got to start with two basic questions to know how to document that source. First of all, what type of source is it? Is it a book? or journal, magazine, or newspaper. Those are the four big types of sources you'll be using. Secondly, you have to know how you access that source. Did you find it in print, the original paper copy, or did you find it electronically online? And when you're online, you have to remember that there are two different and very important ways that you've accessed that information. One is that closed internet, like the subscription databases we get through the library. The second is what we call the open web, which you might find through a Google or Yahoo search. And those each have an impact on how you would document that source. So let's look at an example. This one clearly came from ProQuest, so we know it's that closed internet, that library subscription database. Next we have the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, which is the source itself. In Pittsburgh, the fact that there's a name place in the title indicates to me that it's a newspaper. And sure enough, if I check in Ulrich's database, it tells me that it is indeed a newspaper. Let's look at another example. Again, it comes from ProQuest, that closed internet, that library subscription database. 
And it's from a, a publication called Veterinary Medicine. And if I look in Ulrich's, that is an academic refereed scholarly journal. And so with those two bits of information, it was accessed through a database, and that's a refereed scholarly journal. All I have to do is go to the index or the table of contents or directory in my handbook, and I find that kind of source listed in directory. Again, I'll be looking for the type of um, publication it is and how it was accessed precisely. Now, you need to be able to pull out the information from those sources to document your, um, it in your essay. And you have to remember that every documentation style will look for a few key things. And oftentimes, they're really hard to find in your source. And that is where students mostly struggle. First of all, you have to find the author. And sometimes it's identified by a by or a byline. So that's just another way of saying author. You need, always need the article title from periodicals, and you need the publication name. And sometimes know that if you're looking at the print version of it, it's at the top or the bottom or when the header or footer, and that's where you can find that information. The publication details often also can be fine at the header and footer when you're looking at the print version. But we have two important things that we need to think about. If you're talking about a magazine or a newspaper, we want the day, month, and year. That's because those publications come out on a regular basis, and, they're, and the date is important because they come out by the date. Journals are a little different creature. They are actually one big publication split into fewer, smaller ones throughout the year. So what we want is the volume, the big chunk, the issue, that little chunk that came out, and the year that that journal, particular volume and issue, came out. And remember, the information in that the database provides or that the journal or periodical itself provides probably won't look anything like what you need to doc how you need to document it. Next we have pagination, and that's the pages that an article appeared on. And this is really important for the Modern Language Association because they're dealing with actual words and they want to go find those actual words in the source. So we're talking about three different kinds of pagination here. One is continuous page range. It starts on one page and ends at another. The second is a jump, and that's indicated by the first page number and a plus mark. That means it started on one page and jumped to the other. The next is what we call no pagination, meaning that it was an electronic source that didn't have any kind of pages whatsoever. And the MLA indicates that by the abbreviation NPAG. And I would like one more word of warning here. For all of this information that you see here, remember that whatever it looks like in the original source, it won't look like that when you document it you have to make it look like the documentation style wants it to look. So let's look at an example, again, go back to our examples and look at them about how to pull that information. Take a moment, pause the video, and see where I found the information on this one. Let's look at another example, and again, pause the video and look where I was able to pull the information that I needed to document this source. Another thing to consider when you're pulling information off the web and online and the databases is that you will basically find it in two forms. One is a PDF file and the other is an HTML file. A PDF file stands for Picture Data File, and it's basically a photocopy of the real print page. And the pages, no matter how big or how small you make that window, will always look the same and never change. HTML, or Hypertext Markup Language, allows you to change the size of the screen and the text changes. There is no pagination. Be aware of those two different kinds because it will affect how you document the source. So, another reminder, what 
whatever the original source does, don't copy it exactly. You need to change the formatting, capitalization, italics, how the dates look, how the pagination looks. You need to change that to fit whatever documentation style you're using. Take a moment to look how I changed the original to the documentation here to fit the Modern Language Association style requirements. Now we need to talk about those internal citations and where you find that stuff. Again, here are our two examples that we have to find internal citations for. And the one thing I want you to notice is the author, because the author comes first in the Works Cited page. It and drives what goes in, and that Works Cited page drives what goes in the internal citation. So that becomes important. So if you notice on the first one, it has one author. And on the second one, there's three. So what I need to do is, go to that index or table of contents or directory and I need to find a model for internal citations with one author and two authors and three authors and things like that. Again, find the model that fits your source. And here's the examples. Take a moment to see how I, all I did was take what was in there and match it to what the style MLA wants. The first one had no pagination, so there's no page numbers. The second one did have page numbers, so I had to include it along with the author's last names. One question I often get is what about citation generators? And granted, they can be really helpful, but the board of warning is they're usually wrong, especially the one that comes with your Microsoft Word products. So here's the deal. Can you use them? Yes. Can you use the documentation that comes with some of the database information? Yes, but you still need to learn to check that against whatever style manual you're using if you want to look at right and you want it to be correct. And the other thing is too, it's just you've got to look at the information anyway, so you might as well practice putting it down on the page because sometimes somewhere you may be asked to do some documentation style you've never heard of and you won't have a citation generator to use. And I again, don't panic. We'll work with documentation a lot, especially, especially how to find the information you need so that you can be independent of me when you go to write essays in other classes.